I like it a lot better with the lights up because it looks like friends. It doesn't seem like a big uh, presentation. Well, one of the things I always uh, start off with is after an introduction like that, thanks, Sam, uh, we're not experts. And uh, the reason I say that is it's a journey, and we're all on that journey on how are we going to respond uh, with what we do. I happen to be a home builder, and so um, we're students. We're not experts. And I think that that attitude of approaching uh, the challenges that we have with humility and uh, a recognition of just how daunting the task is uh, keeps us well grounded uh, in order to, to do a good job. So I'm honored to be on the stage with all these great uh, speakers. I'm uh, not sure about Sarah and Ron's judgment in inviting me to be here, but uh, I am happy to share uh, what we've learned over the years. And they told me that right was forward. Ah, aim that way, I guess. So um, I'm uh, the founder of Thrive Home Builders in Denver. We build a couple hundred houses a year. Uh, we're known for affordable housing, for uh, net zero and zero energy ready construction of homes, and for uh, indoor air quality uh, or healthy homes. Um, I'm going to get this right eventually. So there are really three legs to our brand I want to talk to you about. Efficient, healthy, and local. Uh, efficient is about energy efficiency for us. And uh, we made the commitment a long time ago to be 100% zero energy ready. And I'm not sure there's a slide on this later, but I'm going to just butt into my own presentation. One of the things we've learned is uh, if you're going to do this, don't do it as an option. Don't leave these uh, energy efficient features or health features up to the customer to choose. First of all, we found it doesn't work uh, because they won't choose it. And second, you don't get to build a brand around it. And so uh, we're very strong. Uh, the, the advice we give all of our peers is dive in and dive in all the way and stick with it. And that's really been our formula. Uh, healthy is the second leg of our brand, and uh, we're uh, adherent to EPA Indoor Air Plus. You'll hear me talk later on in the presentation how much we believe in these uh, independent, verifiable, science-based standards for the way we build. Uh, I'm quite sure that if we winged it on any of this, we would end up with a lot of unintended consequences and we made the decision long ago that we're not going to uh, turn our customers into lab rats. And then local. And uh, we're in a, a big public company builder dominated market, and they can't say local. And so we've grabbed onto that. And later on in my uh, presentation, I'll explain to you why we think that's important. The image up here is of dead trees. And Colorado has millions of acres of dead trees now. I don't think our big national builders understand how we Coloradans grieve when we go up uh, into the forest and see that. And so the question we pose to our customers is, can anything good come from this? And the answer is yes, we can build your house from that. And we can build your house from trees that already died. And we can assist in the regeneration of those watersheds as, as those uh, millions of acres are, are reclaimed. Uh, we're green, and thanks to Ron and Sarah, they've honored us uh, several times in their publication. Uh, uh, I think last year we got an award. This year I got to judge the awards, uh, which was great. And I have to say that uh, some of the buildings in this year of this year's winners are just beautiful. And I'm a firm believer that it, they can't just be efficient. They have to be beautiful, or, or our customers won't buy them. And then we're uh, well known as an affordable housing builder. We're the largest builder of for sale affordable housing uh, in Colorado. And so how does this square? Uh, how does what I said about making all the things we do a standard feature, and then how do we do it at about half the cost of a median new home price in Denver? And that's what I think maybe we're contributing to the industry, is to uh, learn how to how to build smaller, simpler, 
more constructible, beautiful, high-performance homes. Our current product lines, uh, we used to be a predominantly single-family detached builder. Uh, just, it's really more uh, the availability of land uh, in Denver for smaller builders that's driven us to be a majority townhome builder and a minority single family. So we have uh, three projects of, of uh, townhomes and uh, two of single family. I thought I'd just give you a, a really quick rundown on the evolution of our product. Uh, and Solaris is where it all started for us. Uh, we were been blessed to be in Stapleton, which is the redevelopment of our old airport now for about 20 years in one development. And so along the way, we were, we've been asked repeatedly to up our game uh, along with all the other builders. And uh, in 2009, we decided to offer uh, standard solar. And think about that date. Uh, things weren't great in 2009 for anybody in this industry. And uh, we had competitors offering concessions of $50,000 off of houses in Stapleton to, to get them to move. And our strategy was, let's give them something they can't get anywhere else. And we actually did give it away. That was our concession uh, when we first started offering standard solar back in 2009. Uh, as you can see over the years, we've, uh, we evolved that quite a bit and ended up in uh, 2013 with our first grand award for housing innovation from SAM's program, the DOE Zero Energy Ready Home Program. Then uh, Zen was really our first uh, from a clean piece of paper uh, net zero design. And uh, it's, the top one was really Zen 1.0. That was the, the first of these. And, I remember sitting in a hallway of an architectural control uh, re review meeting for Stapleton. The door was closed and shouting was happening in there. And uh, I'm getting really intimidated because we really had to keep these houses very functional and simple in order to deliver zero energy. And so the door opens and out walks a big luxury builder in, uh, in Stapleton with his a high profile California architect and they're angry and I'm thinking great you know we're gonna walk in there and they're gonna cut us to shreds and so we uh, presented these simple houses and laid it out and I explained to them that I think these might be the first net zero production built houses that we know of and would sure like a chance to do them in Stapleton and they just melted and uh, we had no comments. Uh, and uh, over the years, I will say that some people have called my baby ugly on this, that perhaps they're, they're not the most striking, but you can sure see an awful lot of solar up on that roof. And we sold a lot of Zen 1.0 houses. Uh, and the way we described it is our, our customer shows up in the model home, falls in love with our house. Oh, by the way, it makes all the energy that it needs over the period of a year. Uh, we've evolved this to Zen uh, 2.0, uh, and that's we're currently occupying the model home down in, on the bottom picture, and we're in process on uh, yet another revision of Zen. So uh, it's really been a, a great learning experience and brand builder for us. Our townhomes, I just listed a few of these. Uh, Perrins Row was an infill uh, project in a first ring suburb. The first kind of beachhead of new development that had happened in that uh, first ring suburb in a long, long time. And uh, we, were, we, we actually went to our, our infamous double two by four wall system on townhomes in this project. Uh, we then took our lessons learned at Perrins Row applied them to a Ridgegate three-story uh, project that could actually get to net zero. And then our Ridgegate two-story also got uh, one of the DOE awards. This is a, our current model of our affordable housing. These are geared to 80% of area median income. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think our median new home price in Denver is about $540,000. This house is $215,000. It has a HERS score of 22. Uh, 
It includes a zero down lease for a small solar array, meets all of our EPA and Dora Plus standards. And uh, these are terrific houses for the people who really need them most. Age targeted, uh, we dipped our toe in the water with age targeted uh, product. This is main floor living, so uh, obviously not single story, secondary bedrooms are up. Uh, and we learned something really interesting about uh, empty nester buyers, which I should be one. And that is people object to going up the stairs to the second floor, but they have no problem going down the stairs to a basement. <laughs> but uh, that's what our buyers have taught us. And so I don't, and this was a very successful project, don't get me wrong, but uh, you just learned some crazy things from your customers. You know, I'll go back. This was, uh, that, I won't go back. That, uh, that series was really interesting because in order to have a wide enough plan for a functional main floor uh, bedroom, we couldn't get the density that the developer wanted, the Lowry Redevelopment Authority. So we did a Z-lot plan so that each home had a skinny piece and a wide piece, and the wide piece is what got the, the main floor uh, bedroom, the master bedroom is a really interesting innovation, not just in the way we build and not just at the age targeting, but also at a density move, to, and yet you still end up with great functional floor plan. Healthy Arvita series were the first clean sheet of paper designs for health. Um, and you know, as a production builder, we are, we're doing something Sam hates. I don't know if he's still back there, but uh, he hates it when I say that we design based on dollars per HERS point. And he says, well, wait a minute, the HERS, uh, the HERS software was never designed to be used that way. And it's like, well, but how else are we supposed to use it if we're really trying to get the most bang for the buck for our customers? And so uh, with this one, we, we had rarely taken the leap to balance ventilation, but we felt from a health standpoint, the ERVs were very important. And... Uh, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but all of our houses have active radon mitigation just because we're in a really hot radon zone in Denver. I threw this one in because it's just kind of the culmination of uh, a lot of what we've worked on over the years. I went to Stapleton. I said, uh, you know, uh, I, I have a request. Before this project is done, and we think Stapleton will be about built out in a couple of years, I want one chance to have a segment where we can charge enough for houses that we can do everything that we've learned over our journey. And so they gave us these lots. I called them Panacea, best of all worlds. They're right next to the Rocky Mountain Arsenal Wildlife Refuge, so really close to nature, really close to light rail, uh, net zero, Tesla power wall, uh, vehicle charging, uh, uh, just all the bells and whistles that we could come up with. And in addition, a really interesting Panasonic uh, innovation that I think they're launching uh, at the show tomorrow called Cosmos. We had uh, one of the two first beta versions of that where we monitor indoor air quality on a real-time basis in rooms, and it talks back to the HVAC system and not only says problem, but it manages the HVAC system to get to a solution. And uh, that's really a, a very rich area of innovation and I think market potential is to uh, really work hard on the indoor air quality front. So, you know, I, I put this together and it was sort of a snapshot of, you know, the houses that we built. But uh, I wanted to reflect a little bit more about well, what have we really accomplished and why isn't it being widely adopted by others? And so I thought, well, I'll just give this example that we'll open up a new model and our competitors crawl all over it to see what we're doing, but they never uh, really copy it. And so I came up with this bad joke that, well, we can be really open because nobody really wants our company secrets. And it's not a joke. The problem is that it's not a joke. Um, if this isn't going to be emulated, if it's not going to be imitated, it is not going to grow 
like it needs to grow in order for the industry to really react uh, to our situation. And so I just thought I'd give you a few slides on why I think that is. Why isn't anybody, why don't they want our company secrets? And one is, it's a hard thing to become a high performance builder. Um, and I use the term pain points because I want to refer back to that term uh, later on in the presentation. It takes people. You need at least one champion. It requires a culture shift of your entire organization, and, and you, it's really hard to turn a ship uh, when you're dealing with lots and lots of people that have done it the old way for so long. And so uh, it takes really a, a, an approach of shifting the culture in order to become a high performance builder. You've got to uh, make sure that all of your uh, support people like Raiders and a shout out to Steve Byers and Robbie uh, Schwartz from Energy Logic, who really took our hand early on and taught us so much of the building science that we know today. Uh, and then it takes a high performing trade base, which might be the hardest challenge of all. It also involves risk. Uh, can you fund these projects? And we'd go in early on, I'd go in and talk to lenders, and they'll, they'd just look at me and go, so why are you doing this? Why, why do you have to go do something hard? And we have kind of a bad joke in our company. There's a the smart way, the easy way, and our way. And of course, that our way implies that there's a right way that isn't necessarily the way it's always been done. And so, uh, but you've got to overcome all of that. What if it doesn't sell? You've got to change the way you sell. What if my homes won't appraise because it should come as a shock to no one in this room that it actually does cost more to build a better house? And what if I promise it to my buyers but fall short on execution? And then finally, uh, can it, oops, I, I think I didn't get, yeah, there we go. And then finally, it just takes time. And uh, you can't just flip a switch and go from being a code minimum builder to a high performance builder and one of the things that occurred to me is that that period of time may be longer than a typical division president of a public company will even be in his position because the turnover is so great in those positions or the transfers. Um, it takes persistence, uh, adaptability. You've got to be willing to fail forward because you're not going to get it right on your first houses. And it's just easier to wait for code and let the code make you and your entire ecosystem uh, go for it. So I thought I'd put together just a few lessons from our journey, and uh, we're just a small builder in Denver, and uh, I don't pretend to have all the answers, and yet I think maybe all I can really tell an audience like this is, is what we've experienced. And so you're stuck with the rest of our journey. I'll just keep going. And I entitled this little piece of the presentation, Winning the Hearts and Minds of Your People, Your, your Trades, and Your Customers. And when I think back on all of our accomplishments, I have to say the technological piece has been the easiest. We have the technology. We have the building science. We have great manufacturers where, honestly, most of the R&D happens in our industry. But what we're missing is winning the hearts and minds of the people necessary to make the shift happen. And this guy right here was a real problem. And uh, I'll explain why. In, uh, I think it was back in, you can't read this probably, but it's a pretty old study back in 2008. IBM did this uh, global study of uh, 1,500 executives, 15 countries, and found that 60% of top-down projects fail. And some of them actually make things worse. And then uh, Gallup did a poll back in 2013 and this isn't on the screen, but their finding was that worldwide, 16% of workers are fully engaged in their jobs. That's one in eight. The US and Canada lead the world at 29%.
And that's a crazy thing. I mean, less than one in three people are fully engaged in their jobs. Look around your company. Do you, have you experienced anything like that in your career? Or maybe in your current position? But here's the killer. Almost one in five of them are actively disengaged, trying to undo the progress that the one in three are trying to accomplish. And so when I was reading through all of this, it occurred to me, well, that means it would be possible for us to have two or three times the level of engagement of our people than our competitors. And if that were true, would, be, would we be a really strong uh, competitor and a, and a force to be reckoned with in our market? The other piece of, of this was uh, I'd sort of been beating my head against the wall for a long time. And, uh, you know, I think sometimes people think I'm really smart. It's taken me a really long time to learn a lot of these lessons. Uh, but we would announce a big initiative, and then we'd all have a lot of energy behind it for a little while, and then it would just slowly fizzle, and, you know, a recession would hit, or, or you know, some external event, or worse yet, just the lack of follow-through because of the dailiness of keeping the business running. We just weren't getting results. And so what, I, what was embedded in this uh, information I was reading about is, well, it's because I was doing it. And that if we all did it, if we had a company of champions, where we're all champions, and we had a culture like that, we would have a much higher likelihood of success. So for years, I said, we just got to get everybody on the same page. And so we took it a little bit literally. We have a one-page business plan. It's the only business plan. There's not a big, thick book in the background. It's a one-page business plan. When we started, it was both sides of one page, and we decided that that was just completely too complicated, and that we needed to be on one side of one page, and that is the driving document for our company. Why? Because I had done all kinds of business plans that ended up on a shelf collecting dust that had absolutely no impact. And so what I ask all thrivers is that the one-page business plan must be on their person at all times when they're at work. And when they're in a meeting, the one-page business plan is the smartest person in the room. And that we're all subject to our collective decisions about what it is we're trying to accomplish on the business plan. And so for years I had said, well, maybe the reason that we haven't been able to succeed at what we're trying to accomplish is because I just need to populate this business uh, with believers. And somewhere down the line it hit me how hypocritical that is for management to say, well, I just need a bunch of believers in my company unless top management has taken it upon themselves to build a company worth believing in. And so... Uh, we set out to uh, line out our purpose, our mission, our mantra, and they all had to be things we could believe in. Uh, how's this one? Set a new standard for how home improves life. I can get up in the morning for that. How about be a force for good for our customers, our associates, and our community? Our people can get up in the morning and feel good about going to work to accomplish that. How about always do the right thing? And you know, it's a really tough one, especially when we've hired new people from other builders. Because they come in disengaged, their uh, formula for success has been to keep their heads down and their mouths shut. And then you're telling them, you make the call on the front line, and if you're trying to do the right thing, I'll back you up. And they don't believe me. And it just takes time for people to realize that this is actually true, that we really will back people up. And, and here's, here's the way I look at it. Sometimes it costs money. But if my job is to follow 48 people around who are just trying to do the right thing, I have a great job. But if I'm following people around that didn't, I hate my job. So this is as much for me as it is for them. 
We adopted open book management, and this came from the generosity of another builder um, uh, in, uh, outside of Nashville who did a presentation at one of these conferences and uh, just attested to the fact that they had uh, launched open book management at the beginning of the recession and held true to it all the way through the recession. And the guy who gave the presentation was a guy named Keith Porterfield, and I came up to him and I said, how could you tell them how bleak it looked all the way through the recession? And he said, well, I'll tell you this, that when we had to let people go, everyone knew why. And so it's really a call to stop treating employees like children and to respect the fact that they need the facts in order to even manage their own careers and their own jobs and their own lives. And that they are capable of taking in the picture, the whole picture, good and bad. And I have a confession. We were at the EBA conference last fall. It was in Denver. We got a bunch of awards that year. And uh, the week before, we had had to do layoffs. And I, I felt, well, if we're so good, how do I, in a market like this, how do I fail in a way that we actually have to let people go? And I got an email from our director of construction uh, that just said, we're behind you because we know why you did it. And that's why open book management works, is because we teach people what the numbers mean, and we engage them in the life of our company, good and bad, and then we together have to muddle through, uh, and people at least understand what we're doing. We update our one pager weekly. So every, there's a section of it for the, co the company goals, department goals, or project goals, and personal goals. And that updating is a way to uh, help connect the dots for our people that what I do today takes care of the week, which takes care of the month, which takes care of the quarter, which takes care of the year. Otherwise, some annual goal is just too lofty, it's too indirect, it's too abstract for people to act on. But if together in your team you come up with this needs to happen this week, and if it happens, well, the months take care of themselves, the quarters take care of themselves, the years take care of themselves, and that's how we meet our goals. Uh, one of the ways we do this is a weekly huddle for our small groups. It could be project-based, almost always uh, uh, multidisciplinary, because guess what? Uh, most builders are designed by uh, departments. No single department is really our profit center. Only projects are profit centers. And so we disaggregate the departments and put people into functional groups, and, uh, and then we meet. And how did we do this week? How did, I, how did I do last week? What do I need to do the following week? And then we have a practice that's become a discipline in our company that after every meeting, we talk about wins and gratitudes. And it's just psychology. We spend all week long solving problems, which is a negative thing to have to do. If all you're doing is focusing on what went wrong, you can become just a real curmudgeon of a builder. And I think maybe the experience of living through the recession, and maybe you guys have, have experienced it as well, we have so much to be grateful for, even in a bad week. And if we can keep our people's heads up there, instead of down with all the problems, uh, we have a totally different environment in our company. And then the great huddle, we pull together all of our employees on a, a monthly basis, we update financials, we go through how we're doing on our plan, uh, we teach financial literacy there, uh, and uh, Again, company-wide wins and gratitudes. And here's the cool thing. It's all, the wins and gratitudes are almost always for another thriver. And nothing quite builds a team like that. And so it's a little bit messy. Um, you know, that I guess some people say dictatorships are the most efficient form of government. And I'm not saying that we're a democracy by any means. 
But I am saying that collaboration is messy and it takes time. And there are times when you think you have the right answer, but you just have to get through this process. And then sometimes it's like, wow, maybe that wasn't the right answer. But the bottom line is that uh, 48 minds are better than one. And when we're done, because of the buy-in that happens through open book management and collaboration on goals, we actually accomplish things. I love this uh, line that came out of the Great Game of Business uh, book. For every two hands we hire, we get a free brain. If we would just respect that fact. And by the way, the biggest shocks of my career have been when I found out that that super quiet person in accounting is actually a leader. Or that really meek person off in uh, planning is an artist. And, we, and by respecting these uh, gifts that our people have and engaging them and valuing them and remembering them in our wins and gratitudes, we can draw those out and it really helps us be better. It's also a better way to live if you're a, a thriver. The next piece I'll talk about is uh, winning the hearts and minds of our trade partners, and this is a picture of Juan. And I want to tell you this story. Um, we had a trade partner appreciation dinner one time, and one of our plumbers came up. Uh, MK Plumbing, my kind of plumbing, that's what that stands for. Uh, this plumbing company was founded by this woman's father and it was passed down to her. And uh, she came up to me at the end of one of these uh, dinners and she just said, I'd like to have lunch with you. And I naturally go, okay, well, she's got to complain about somebody. But uh, so she shows up for lunch. We go have lunch and she just said, I just wanted you to know we fired our last big builder. I can't take the way I'm treated by big builders. And I just want to do more with you. And so that, uh, that hit me uh, hard. And I thought, well, do we abuse our trades? Is it possible that maybe we're just as bad as the big bad builders? And so I, I went into uh, our next great huddle, and I, we were in the jaws of the trade shortage. And uh, we had a, a project that had bid right about that time, and we bid it out to 15 uh, framers, and we got one bid response. That's how tight the trade shortage was. And so I explained to our people that we're going to deploy our secret weapon and we're going to beat the trade shortage. And our secret weapon is us. And so we set up this uh, little procedure that when you witness a job well done by one of our crews, thank them. Then send an email to their boss. Copy me on the email. I'll call the boss. We'll have lunch. I'll tell them that uh, we appreciate you and would like to do more with you and we'll build these relationships and we're going to get through this uh, trade shortage. So I get this uh, email praising Juan and Tony from TJ Excavation. And so I do what I said I'd do. I send him an email, love to have lunch. I get nothing. Next week I ping him again. Okay, my partner and I will come and have lunch. The day comes and two Hispanic guys show up in matching black leather jackets. They are visibly uncomfortable in our lobby. And I can tell that this isn't going to go, this isn't going to be very chummy. And so, sports. Maybe sports would be a way that I could bridge the gap. So let's go to Elways. And it's like, oh no, no, we can't go to Elways. Elways is an expensive steakhouse. And so we settled on pizza. So we have this awkward stroll down to this pizza place. And uh, I asked him, so how many builders do you work with? One. We had put them in business, and I didn't even know it. Thanks, purchasing, for letting me know. How many employees do you have? Two. 
and I realized that to have lunch with me, they're not getting paid. And so my script is shot. And I'm like, tell me your story. So Juan has the better English. So he says, well, I apologize for not answering your first email. I have a sixth grade education from Mexico. I'm lucky I can read. I was afraid I would embarrass myself. He came to the U.S. legally. He worked his way up for 20 years with a big uh, basement contractor in Denver that works for the big guys. Ended up the general foreman. Started having stroke symptoms on the job. Drove himself to an emergency room. He was lying on a gurney and said, this job is killing me. And when he recovered, he and his brother-in-law, Tony, started TJ Excavation. He says, I drive a 1999 Chevy Silverado. I live in a mobile home. We bought and paid for all of our equipment in the first year of working with you. They told me that there are legal Mexican construction workers in Denver building houses for themselves in Mexico because they don't want to be where they're not wanted. There was a time when we called Juan's story the American dream. And I grieve the fact that we have so disabused the people who build our homes that they just want to leave. So now, when I drive around, and uh, Tony is uh, on his backhoe. They stop their equipment and they come and talk to me. Word got around it on this story and I got this call from a woman named Diane Olick and I didn't know who she was. And Juan ended up, Juan and I ended up on CNBC telling this story because it's a story that needs to be heard in our country today. We always remember that the owners of our trades aren't the ones who build our houses. The most popular thing we do is an ice cream truck on a hot day in the summer. And our crews love working for Thrive. How easy is that? We have a trade council, uh, nine people who come together. They're unpaid. They represent all of our subs and they problem solve to make our businesses, our relative businesses, our, um, succeed. Their first task was to develop a job ready, job complete handbook. They wrote a job ready, job complete handbook for Thrive. And here's how it works. It's a list of checklists for every trade. And it's like so low tech. You take the handbook, you tear out your page, the foreman has to sign, to fill out this checklist that he's completed his work. He has to sign it. He has to track down our superintendent, look him in the eye, hand it to our super, and say, this job is complete. We did a lean building blitz with uh, True North. And we identified $2.7 million in trade partner savings if everybody did their job right the first time and cleaned up after themselves. And we have pulled 100 days off of our building schedule. And for those of you who are builders out there, a day is precious. We have pulled one, now we started at a really high number in the middle of the, of the trade shortage, but together through collaboration, we have pulled 100 days off of our bill cycle. We follow through on what we've learned, and the folks from True North said, we, we did the, these comparative surveys of uh, trade partner attitudes towards us in December of 17 and 18, and they said it was the biggest single turnaround they'd witnessed in working with over 75 builders. That's a testimony to our culture. 
the culture that our people were behind it and our trades were engaged and were working together to make each other better. The next and last piece here is winning the hearts and minds of our customers. And uh, Sarah and Ron have heard me say this, uh, we're actually environmentalists. We just happen to deal in the human environment. And we want our customers to thrive and prosper. Who is our buyer? Sam loves it when I say this. If he's back there, he'll probably chuckle. A 30, yep, I heard, oh, there he is. 35-year-old woman who drives a Prius, shops at Whole Foods, and has boulder-like tendencies. And anywhere I go in the country, everybody knows what a boulder-like tendency is. And I love this uh, quote from a book, The New Rules of Green Marketing. The green consumer revolution has been led by women aged between 30 and 49 with children of better than average education, motivated by a desire to keep their loved ones free from harm and to secure their future. We think she's a strong CEO for the family. She's the primary shopper, and she makes buying decisions. She confidently pays more for things that she believes offer superior value and performance. That's really important for a high-performance builder because we have to get paid more than the commodity builders we compete against. As a consummate consumer, she looks for authenticity, honesty, credibility from the brands that she chooses. That's why we have all the labels. That's what the Zero Energy Ready Home label is about for us. That's what the EPA Endorer Plus label is because every builder says, I build a quality house. And our retort to that is, says who? We know some builders that adopted their own green standard and then brag about how they comply with it. And she loves local. She seeks control, empowerment, and peace of mind by knowing she's done all she can for the people she loves. And when, as a home builder, we can come alongside her in, and help her on that quest, it's not about granite countertops anymore. We uh, authentically provide credibility uh, with the homes we built, with the labels that we use. We provide an economic case to show that even though the first cost of the home is more, the energy savings can offset all of that, and you really don't pay more to operate your home on a monthly basis uh, than you would uh, just, just buying a code-built home. We believe that buying a home is fundamentally emotional, and if we only appeal to like a rational basis, we're going to miss the boat. I love this. Uh, this image that there's our 35 year old woman there's the one thing she cares about the most in the world the air she breathes is just as important as the food she eats we are we populated our sales force with believers that's essential we train them well we use great models to reinforce that uh, uh, emotional uh, decision of buying and our sales office messages are really targeted at making sure people understand this is a meaningful decision. That is a stack of $20 bills that adds up to $106,000. That's how much money we'll save our customers over the life of owning this home. What will you do with the savings? So we're the low-cost producer of homes that no one else has. Our homes will help pay for their energy, make you healthier, and will give you the peace of mind of knowing that you've done all you can for the people you love. In order to mainstream uh, more sustainable housing, we really need to deal with these pain points, and I'll quickly go through these last slides. Uh, there's so many good uh, training resources out there. And I want to put a plug in for the Energy and Environmental Building Alliance. Uh, EBA is curating these in a way that will make it easier for builders to uh, take advantage of the training. Uh, almost all of our field people are, are EBA certified uh, with EBA Sites Supervisor or EBA Certified Builder uh, certifications. We love the way that our successes in high performance building are highlighted, and Sam's been a real pioneer in this with his uh, housing innovation awards. 
And then we're starting up at EBA uh, Builder Benchmark Group, which is a community of uh, mutually supportive builders to do financial metric benchmarking on the premise that we get better homes and more homes built if the businesses who are building them are successful. So to deliver sustainability to mainstream housing, my most important message is don't go it alone. Use the proven third party and unparalleled building science and market support behind the programs and join the high performance builder community. Learn from the journeys of others. Plug into the best practices to build great businesses that we need to build great houses. After all, we're willing and enthusiastic about sharing our company secrets. Thank you.